Social Coding Club is a monthly meetup here in LA. It's on every third Wednesday of the month, and there are two talks, one beginner and one advanced, and it's hosted at this nerdy venue called The Rest Around. After the talks, you can get different food at different routes. They usually have the same two choices, avocado salad and shrimp burger. Well, what I hunger for though is shrimp salad. But unfortunately, there is no get salads with shrimp route. So what can I do? I get the shrimp from the burgers, of course. I first go to the get salads route and then I go to get burgers and fetch the three burgers that I want, so I have three shrimps in my salad. Then I go to a free seat at the table, I pick out the shrimps, I throw away the rest. And boy, am I happy to have my shrimp salad. But after I finish, I kind of feel sad because I've stand like, I had to stand in two lines instead of just one. I wasted a lot of time that I could have spent with my friends and I wasted a lot of food. But hey, at least now I have a great example to explain the concepts of under and over fetching. So let's do some coding. I created an empty folder which I initialized as a node project using npm in it. Then I installed the express server framework I create a server.js file and open it in my text editor. Then I require express and I create an instance of it. And then I register a very simple route, the root route which would just return hello world. I tell express on which port number I wanted to listen. And I start the server using supervisor. Supervisor will automatically restart the server every time I make a change to the file. So that is very handy. Opening localhost 4000 now shows me hello world. All right, so that works. I remove the hello world route now and replace it with routes for salads and burgers. I define two objects for salad and burger with their ingredients. Then I define two arrays with 100 items of each. Then I define a route for salads, which will respond with the salads as an array JSON, and the same for burgers. Opening the salads route in the browser returns 100 salads, and the same for burgers. But what I really want is to have only one item by default. And I wanted to also accept an optional count argument so people can request more than one. So I dubbed the route handlers to read out the count parameter and return a slice of the respective array with the length of count, which I default to one. And then I remove the duplicated code into helper method get to make the whole thing a little bit simpler. So that works great. By the way, if you have any questions about the code that I'm showing, ask me at any time. I can dive into each of the steps. So I can go over here, I have all the code here, um, so we can, we can look over it if you have any questions on how things work. All right. Switching to the client side. I get a salad by requesting the salads route in the browser. But after this request, I'm still lacking my shrimps. And this is exactly what is referred to as underfetching. I went, I received data from one route, but I'm still lacking some ingredients. Then I get my three burgers from the burgers route, and I reduce my burgers to the shrimps. So three shrimps is exactly what I wanted, but what I received are three burgers with all the ingredients, most of which I will have to throw away now. And this is what is referred to as overfetching. Hmm. So back to the social coding club. The team are very kind and environmentally conscious people. They don't want to see so much food go to waste 
And after some research, they find out about GraphQL, which seems to address the problem perfectly. So for the next meetup, they set up new routes besides get salads and get burgers. Now there is also post GraphQL. There is no written menu for GraphQL. Instead, they set up a terminal which attendees can use to write and post their query. They call it GraphQL Queryator 3000. And it's just a fancy name for a thing called graphical, spelled graph IQL. It's somewhat hard to pronounce if you don't know it. I guess that's why GitHub is calling its own graphical explorer. Graphical shows all available options as I type. There is no more guessing, no more looking up of property names and documentation, and most importantly, no more out of sync documentation because the documentation is generated from the same schema that the server clients are using. So in this query, I request one salad with all ingredients but tomato, as well as the shrimps from three burgers. The response from the server follows the tree structure of my query and it includes exactly what I asked for, not less and not more. So how does it work? And what is GraphQL anyway? But just like REST, GraphQL is only a specification. It is not a tool. It is not a library that is ready to use. Instead, GraphQL is language agnostic. Any programming language can be used on both the server and the client to implement and consume a GraphQL MPI. It all starts with a schema, excuse me. A schema is a simple text file. I'll call mine schema GraphQL. A schema has to follow the syntax defined by GraphQL specification. First, I have to define the query type. The query type defines what can be requested at the root. In this case, it's salads and burgers. An optional count argument can be passed. It defaults to one. So salads returns an array of type salad, which has ingredients like avocado, mango, cucumber, which are all floats, and floats are low for the decimal point. Onion is Boolean, so you either want onion or not. And burger buns are integer, because a burger with half a bun is no burger. This is the entire GraphQL schema for our API. So this is just 20 lines of code. For the server, I first need to install two more dependencies, Apollo Server Express and GraphQL Tools. Once the install is done, I can restart the server. After that, I require the middleware for the GraphQL API and the web app, as well as a few helper methods. Then I read the schema source file into a variable and compile it into a schema format that the middleware will understand. Finally, I add routes for the GraphQL API as well as graphical web apps. Now, when I open graphical, route in the browser, I can now send queries to the server and I get autocomplete as shown before, but I don't get any results yet. And this is because I have to tell the server what to do if salads or burgers are requested, for which I need to define resolvers. Resolvers is an object with a query key, the entry point as defined in a schema before. And for each of the query entry points, I have to define functions which get called whenever salads or burgers are requested. Here I reuse the get helper method that I defined before. Then I have to add the resolvers object to the compiled schema. When I send my query again, I will now receive data in return. Sending a query from the client is as simple as posting the query as a JSON object. I simply copy and paste the query string into a variable, then I post a JSON object with the query. The server responds with the same JSON as shown above. I can destruct it into my salad and burgers and then reduce uh, my burgers into the shrimps and add them to my salad. So I can enjoy my avocado salad in good conscience now. I only stayed in the line once and I did not waste any food, at least not on my side. So at the next meetup, Everyone wants to try out the GraphQL Queryator 3000. 
and the result is quite a long line. Getting exactly what we want is great, but entering the query each time makes much longer, uh, takes much longer than just fetching a burger from the get burgers route. And after posting the query, the robot server has to process the new order on the spot. So the social coding club team comes together again and thinks about a solution to make the posting and the processing of GraphQL queries more efficient. And they come up with something, remembering queries. So each time I post a query, I get asked, do I want my query to be remembered? If I say yes, I get an ID for a reference for my query in return. The team also sends an email ahead of the next event asking the attendees to pre-register the queries. With such information up front, the team can already prepare some of the food, which also reduces the processing time. Persistent queries are a simple query string stored with a unique ID in a key value store. In my example server, I created a file which has one persistent query with the ID one. So in the server, I load the persistent queries and add a middleware for all requests going to GraphQL. If um, an ID was posted in the post body, and if a persistent query with the past ID exists, then I set the query from the ID which is persisted in the store. That means I no longer need to post the query. Instead, I can just post my ID. The result is the same as before. I get the exact same response, but the request is tiny in comparison. And this can, be, this can have a very high impact for GraphQL because queries can sometimes become kilobytes of size. They get very, very complex. Added to that, the upstream connectivity, especially for mobile devices, is usually much worse than the downstream connectivity. And on the server side, it's just great to know which queries will be, um, will be uh, requested ahead of time. I can prepare caches more intelligently. And if I want to, I can disable non-persisted queries altogether, which would greatly increase my security. The Social Coding Club is growing in popularity and more often than not, the event runs out of food before everyone could get a bite. So far, the food was delivered by a caterer, but the team decides that they will hire a cooking team that can create more burgers and salads to meet the growing demand. So mutations are part of the GraphQL specification and have to be defined in the GraphQL schema. First, I add a mutation to add salads, the mutation accepts an optional count argument, which defaults to one, and the mutation will return an integer. Same with burgers. Then in the server code, I implement the resolvers for the mutations. They simply add more items based on the past count argument and then return the total number. Then I initialize salads and burgers with empty arrays. Sending a query requesting a salad will return an empty array now because there are no salads yet. I have to submit add salads mutations first. I can send multiple mutations per request, which is great, and a server will process them sequentially to avoid tracing conditions. Mutations are posted, uh, are posted by clients just like queries but the two cannot be combined. All right, bear with me. We are nearly through. The last part is a bit more complicated, but also hella more exciting, I think. So let's talk about GraphQL subscriptions. When the rest turnaround is out of salad or burgers, it is rather annoying to be the front in line waiting and asking repeatedly if I can have my salad yet. Instead, I want the server to tell me when there is enough food available. And this is one common use case for subscriptions. 
Subscriptions is the third operation type of GraphQL. GraphQL has built-in support for subscriptions over WebSockets, and they can be submitted just like queries and mutations. Once submitted, the server responds that the data will appear once there is a change. So let's make a change. I leave the subscription as is and post mutations in a separate window. As you can see, immediately after I post the mutation, the numbers on the other window are changing accordingly. All right, let's make it work. First, I add subscription to the schema. The food added subscription will be called with type stat, which has integer properties for the total number of available salads and burgers. Then, before adopting the server, I have to install two more modules. Then I require the new modules and I add the subscriptions endpoint to the graphical route. For WebSockets, I have to start another server. So instead of app listen, I create a server instance that I can pass in to the subscription server constructor. Then I publish the food added event in the mutation resolvers. And I have to define the get stats helper, which I've used in the PubSub publish calls. Then I add the subscription to the compiled schema. The syntax for the food added subscription resolver looks a bit different due to the different nature of subscriptions. All right, now I can restart the server, reload graphical, and subscriptions are now available. All right, thank you very much. You have any questions?